All righty. Welcome everybody to Design Leaders in Tech. Um, so thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is the Student Design Hub Speaker Series where we get our local tech leaders from the province of Newfoundland and Labrador to come in and talk about the local tech community and how they approach product development. Um, so before we get started, I have a couple of quick housekeeping items and then we'll get kicked off. Um, you're going to notice that this is WebEx events instead of WebEx, so you might not necessarily see your other participants. Uh, you're not alone out there. Uh, the chat function does work, so if you want to ping us in the chat, you sure can. Um, Q&A is the same thing, so uh, the only thing about Q&A is those kind of stay private, so only myself and Bethany will be able to see those. Um, if you want to ask us a question directly, so if you want us to put you on camera so you can ask, uh, just put a little asterisk or like a dollar sign or something in front of your question, and then I'll find you in the crowd and I'll pull you up so you can ask your question in person. Um, so if you do send something through Q&A, you can kind of direct it to an individual. Uh, just try to make sure you ping it to myself or Bethany so we can keep track of what questions are going where so we don't miss any of your questions. And uh, if you're having any technical difficulties, just send us a little ping in there as well, and we'll see if we can get you sorted out. So with, without any further delay, I'm excited to hand things off to Bethany Randall, uh, electrical engineer with Kraken Robotics. I'm really excited for her presentation because we used to be uh, old Eastern Edge Robotics buddies. And uh, we'll hand it off to you, Bethany. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, so hi, everybody. Uh, like Kyle said, my name is Bethany Randall and I'm an electrical engineer here at Kraken Robotics. Um, today, I'm going to talk about how my experiences on the Memorial University competitive ROB team, Eastern Edge Robotics, uh, really shaped my career and how the lessons that I learned um, on my time on the team are still very valuable to me uh, today, and I still use them at work all the time. So, uh, get started. Uh, so, quick brief table of contents here. Um, things I'm going to talk about. Who am I, and how did I get where I am? Um, hey, Bethany, then uh, we can't see your presentation. Oh gosh! One second. <laughs> oh. 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 Sorry. Uh, Kraken's really cool and lets me keep my dog at work. So, if you hear her barking in the background, I'm really sorry. All right, we're all good there. We can see your slide. All right, cool. Let's try. Hey, let's try this again. Um, all right, so table of contents. Uh, who am I and how did I get here? Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, ROV 101 and Eastern Edge Robotics, just give you a brief overview of what those things are. Um, so I'm going to use some terms throughout the presentation that probably won't make sense if you don't know what an ROV is. Um, and then I'm <clears throat> going to talk about uh, the at least seven lessons that I learned um, during my time at Eastern Edge Robotics, uh, like I said, that I still use every day. And then finally, uh, I'm going to give you a little story um, <laughs> that uh, kind of brings all those things together where I should have used all of these lessons in order to solve a big problem. Um, and uh, then at the end, we'll have a conclusion and some questions. So who am I and how did I get here? Um, so I got introduced to robotics back in uh, grade nine um, through the first Lego League robotics competition. Um, I had a really great mentor there. Um, we actually won the Newfoundland regionals the year that I participated and we ended up going to the World Festival for first, uh, which took place in Atlanta, Georgia. And that was a really neat experience because I got to go to a football stadium that was completely filled with kids like me who were really interested in science, technology, engineering, and math. And everybody was uh, really cheering on their little robots, uh, completing various tasks, and it was really inspiring um, event for me. So I came back and uh, my mentor was like, you know, you could consider engineering um, for, a, uh, for a career. So uh, when I got into high school, I joined the MATE ROV competition. Uh, my school had a uh, had a competition team. And uh, the first year I was in, uh, in high school, uh, my team ended up winning that regional competition as well. And we got to go to internationals again, which was really cool, uh, except for 
The international competition that year was in Newfoundland, so we got to go from Carabineer to St. John's, which is not that much of a trip. Um, but what was really neat was we got to uh, showcase the fantastic facilities that uh, Newfoundland has to offer um, with regards to marine technology. Um, so after high school, uh, or sorry, during high school, I got in contact with some mentors at um, Eastern Edge Robotics, and they said, you know, if you're interested in this and you want to do it as a career, keep an eye out for Eastern Edge uh, when you come to university. So when I graduated high school, I went to Mon, um, and that was a really big draw for me, was the world-renowned Eastern Edge Robotics team. Uh, and I competed with Eastern Edge for the five years that I was in university. I joined straight when I was in first year, and I got to compete in five international competitions there against universities from all over the world. Um, the first year was in Hawaii, and then we went to the neutral buoyancy lab at NASA in Texas, and then we went to Orlando, Florida, Seattle, and Alpena, Michigan. Um, and then I graduated university uh, after finishing up that last competition, and I uh, graduated with my Bachelor of Engineering in 2014 and then i started working at kraken uh back in december of 2014 and i have been here and happy ever since um so what is an rov an rov is a remotely operated vehicle so it is a robot that a pilot flies through the water um so you can see here let's get my mouse over there uh so you can see here this is our uh robot um it has uh, several features that are pretty common to all underwater vehicles. The first one being the electronics can, uh, which was my personal favorite part of the RV. Uh, so, of course, you can't really uh, put electronics in water, so they need to be housed in a can to keep them all nice, safe and dry. Um, and then we have the thrusters, which provide mobility underwater. So they're just, they're just motors to give us propulsion. Um, we have a tooling skid under here that allows us to manipulate um, objects underwater. And the one of the other key parts about an ROV is this tether. Um, so it's a tether that connects the robot back to its top side control unit over here. So that's usually a computer or uh, a couple of computers. Um, we have our power supplies that provide power down to the, the ROV. Um, and we have various ways of controlling the ROV, such as uh, joysticks and this panel to operate tools. Um, so uh, the pilot of the ROV actually only gets to see this. That's what they're flying with. They have a couple of camera feeds and some telemetry, um, things like thruster speed or temperature measurements and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so that's they're flying underwater. The idea being that in the real world, these robots operate um, well under the water, uh, you know, hundreds of meters down in some cases, and uh, and that's all you're working with. So you can't turn around and just watch it operate. Um, so, what is Eastern Edge Robotics? Um, Memorial University has a world-renowned ROV team that competes in the annual MATE International ROV Competition. So, MATE is the Marine Advanced Technology Education Center. Um, every year they release a challenge to uh, teams, like I said, from all over the world, um, where you have to build a robot that's going to complete tasks in a pool. Um, so you can kind of see this is this is our robot going down in the water. Um, luckily, sometimes they have cameras underwater that let the audience actually see what's going on. Um, so it has to manipulate uh, and complete different tasks with these props down here. Uh, there's a couple other parts of the competition as well. There's an engineering panel where you get to um, explain your robot to a panel of judges who are generally industry experts. Um, there's a poster media display, so it's essentially a product brochure for your um, for your robot, as well as a technical report, which really gets into the nitty gritty details of your design process, why you designed, what uh, what you did, um, and the challenges that you faced along the way. So, getting into our lessons, um, the very first lesson that I learned was keep it simple, um, complicated tools are more likely to break, there's more things that can go wrong with them. Um, so if you're going to build a tool to complete a task, keep it as simple as possible. So on the left hand side here, we have this monstrosity of a device, which was called the Pleopods. And it had belts and it had gears and it was hooked up to the bottom of the ROV and you had to very accurately align it with uh, the objects that you were trying to pick up. And 
Sure, it would work most of the time, but it would also break a lot and we were constantly trying to fix it. So every year after this, uh, this tool got held up as like a trophy of don't, don't design something that is this complicated um, because it doesn't help, it doesn't work in the end. So on the right hand side uh, of the screen here, you see my high school solution for a gripper. Um, so we were a very small team in high school. We didn't have very much of a budget and sure you can buy grippers for your ROV on the internet. Like those really nice articulate claws to pick stuff up. Um, we didn't have the budget for it and we didn't have the ability to, um, program it and control it and stuff. We, we just couldn't, couldn't make that work. Um, again, it was complicated for us. So instead we went to the dollar shop and we picked up a pair of salad tongs and we rigged it up with a cable and a motor and it worked great. Um, they never broke, they never tired. Um, we actually won an innovation award just for the fact of using an everyday device in a really novel way. Um, another thing, uh, one of my mentors imparted a really great piece of advice to me and I still think about it all the time is you can accomplish a lot with a stick. Um, you can, you can move things with a stick. You can pick things up with a stick. There's, they don't break. And when they do break, it's really easy to replace. Um, so yeah, so simple tools are better and even better if the same simple tool can be used for to solve multiple problems, multiple tasks, then that's, that's even better again. Um, so next thing, don't get attached to, to designs. So in my very first year of Eastern Edge Robotics, like I said, I'd been working towards and dreaming about joining Eastern Edge at MON um, for like three years when I was in high school. And I was one of two first years to uh, start on the team that very first year when I was in Eng one. And I, um, I showed up and one of the tasks that we had to do that year was pick up these fishing lure grubs. Um, you can kind of you can kind of see them here uh, sticking out. So they were little grubs with a hook in them. And they were hung up on a wall, and we had to collect at least three of them and bring them back to the surface. So I came up with this idea based around the upholstery attachment on my mom's vacuum cleaner um, that we could just brush them off the wall. So we'd start at the bottom of the of the wall and move the ROV up, and as it did, the the brushes would rotate and the grubs would fall into a basket. And it wasn't it wasn't that complicated. I mean, it's just it's just a spinning brush. Um, so I worked, I, I bought a bunch of, um, vacuum attachments. I worked really hard for weeks and weeks on designing this beautiful rotating brush apparatus. I had a bilge pump motor. I had a gear train. Um, there was a collection basket underneath here. I ended up adding a baffle across the top because sometimes the grubs would get stuck to the brushes and they would rotate out. Uh, so. And we were pretty late into the year uh, when we were practicing this with this thing. And it turns out that it was actually a little bit cumbersome to operate. And the other first year that had joined with me uh, made a comment of why are we using the vacuum attachment when we could just use the vacuum instead? And he very quickly whipped up this trident shaped prong of PVC pipe and hooked it up to a bilge pump motor to provide some suction. And then very neatly, the ROV was able to go and pick off the little grubs and keep them. We didn't have to worry about them falling out of a basket. As long as there was suction on it, uh, they stuck. And, uh, you know, they could come back up to the surface and it was a way better design. It was way simpler. It was way faster. It was just better. Um, so I had to throw away the design that I had spent weeks and weeks and weeks perfecting. Uh, but you know what? In the end, it was a better decision. It was better design. So don't get attached. Don't keep trying to make the, the solution that you built work when there's a better solution available. Uh, so lesson three, labs in school are not the same as hands-on experience. Um, so I always found two things with labs. One is if you're working on a lab and it's late, in the day and you have um, an assignment due the next day and you have an exam the following day and you have all these other things to do and it's going to take you another four hours to figure out the last question on your exam or sorry on your on your lab you look at it overall and you say okay what is this lab worth to me in the end like 0.1 of a percent on my final grade whatever i can move on i'll skip that part not a big deal um 
if you are working on an ROV or on any team project, whether it's Baja or ROV or Sailbot or whatever, if your thing doesn't work, you need to figure out a way to make it work. And either you solve the problem that you're having or you work around that, that problem, you do something. Because if your robot doesn't work in the end, um, you know, all that work has gone to waste and, uh, and you can't compete. So uh, that was one thing. The second thing was I always found labs very artificial. Um, you know, you follow a set of instructions that about a topic that you may or may not have already covered in um, in classes. And, you know, do your inputs match these inputs that you get? Do your outputs match the outputs that are described in the lab? Yes or no, move on, learn the theory and that's it. The thing about labs is they never teach you why. They never teach you why filter caps or, or decoupling capacitors are so critical um, in a in a circuit. They never teach you why use a MOSFET or a BJT in order to make a switch, which ones to use. Um, versus when you're working on a student team, you need to figure out why. And if you, um, you know, and it's, and it's more sparking your curiosity and solving problems. Um, so, and this is what we look for um, when I'm at Kraken and I'm looking through student resumes or, or um, general uh, engineering resumes. Show me what you can do. Don't like grades are fine, but have have some experience to back that up. Show that you can work hands on. Uh, so lesson four: School doesn't teach you everything. There were several things that I learned while working on the ROV team that never came up when I was getting my degree in school. Um, one of those things was working on a multidisciplinary team. So when I did my final design project, we were a group of um, just electrical engineers, I think, and one software guy. Um, and it was fine for us because we were just um, working on a purely electrical design. But for anyone that had to uh, work on a project that had any mechanical operations at all, like a wind turbine, that's a pretty big part of a wind turbine is, is, is the mechanical section. Um, so I learned about how all the different disciplines fit together and no one discipline can completely solve, solve a problem by itself uh, through ROV. So I need to build the electronics in order to make the robot move. Um, but those electronics need to fit in the space and in the, the housing that mechanical needs to design. And software needs to work with the electrical components that I have, and I have to provide software with electrical components that they can interface with. So there's all these pieces that have to fit together. No one discipline can solve a problem. And I, I found that was missing, and I wouldn't have gotten that experience um, if I wasn't on a student team. The other big thing and probably my favorite thing um, that I now do as part of my job is printed circuit board design or PCB design. Um, so in my final year of ROV, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, the size restrictions um, for the, the robot changed drastically. And we had to streamline um, the much bigger electrical system that we had into a more modular design. So instead of having a bunch of solder splices and terminal blocks everywhere, I decided the best way to streamline everything was make printed circuit boards. Um, so the one that you're looking at right now is my very first attempt at um, a power distribution board. Um, so your input power would come in here, there'd be a DC-DC converter to um, drop the voltage down, and then a pile of connection points for all the devices that needed to use this lower voltage to plug into. So instead of having like a long um, wiring harness with splices everywhere, um, they could all plug into this singular, uh, singular place. And printed circuit board design was not something that I learned in school. It never even got brought up um, while, when I was in school. I had to learn it on my own. I'm so glad I did. I use it at least weekly at Kraken, it's arguably my favorite part of my job now is designing PCBs. Um, but yeah, that was it was something that I never would have learned, uh, I never would have had exposure to really um, if I wasn't on a student team or if I didn't take up a project um, outside of school. 
Uh, so lesson number five, blowing stuff up, blowing stuff up is okay, asterisk. It is okay to blow things up if you meet three conditions. One, no one gets hurt, safety first. Two, only if the part is not irreplaceable because you really can't blow up irreplaceable parts. Uh, and number three, if you learn from it, so you never do it again. Um, so some of the, these are just a few of the things that I have uh, I've, I've blown up during the course of my um, between university and uh, work. Uh, so here we see one of my other first PCBs, um, and it has these big things on here, these big can-shaped devices that are called capacitors. Uh, so capacitors act as a uh, in this case, they're acting as a filter, but they they store charge. They are polarized. They have a positive and a negative. And if you plug them in backwards, they will blow up and they will release what old electrical engineers like to call the blue magic smoke that is supposed to make all electronics work. Um, and if they're this big, they might even release enough blue magic smoke to potentially fill up the electronics bay or the ROV bay at the Reed Institute. Um, so now I always check polarity so that I never blow up these capacitors again. Um, same is true for power supplies. So you don't want to plug a power supply in backwards. Positive and negative makes a difference. Uh, next thing was if power is available to an open circuit, wire strippers will complete that open circuit. Uh, so I learned this the hard way when I was working on a cable um, that had no load attached. It was just uh, it was plugged in on one end and not the other, and I needed to swap the connector for something. Um, and again, there was no there's no electrons flowing because the circuit was open. So I snipped through it with a pair of wire strippers, and very very quickly my wire strippers completed that circuit, and it shorted I don't know 24 or 48 volts to ground um, and vaporized those. Uh, wire strippers, like a little piece of the wire strippers flew off. So always uh, always turn the power off before you start cutting away at wires. And then the last one here, um, so isolated grounds, the, the way voltage works, the way current flows is uh, you need to have a, a start path and a return path. Um, and if you uh, connect the, the start path to a different return path, and of course, current won't flow. Um, so it is not okay to plug in a high voltage uh, power line into a low voltage signal line that is going to your microcontroller. So if you put a 48 volt line into, uh, or 48 volts rather, into a line that's only expecting and can only handle 3.3 volts, bad things are going to happen and you will likely blow up your microcontroller. Um, and in this case, this was one of those irreplaceable part moments. Uh, thankfully, the grounds were isolated and uh, and nothing blew up, but it was a very scary moment and it, uh, it nearly caused us a lot of problems. So um, always check the voltage, check the continuity when you're uh, when you're doing stuff. Uh, next thing, documentation is critical. Uh, the work isn't done when a product is built. You need to be able to explain how to use and how to fix that product after you've built it um, and why you built it the way you did generally so that the next person to come along says, you know, oh, why didn't you build it this way? Well, it turns out that if you document it, uh, it turns out that, well, we tried it that way and it didn't work for these reasons. Um, it's also very important for testing, document, what you have tested, what you have not tested, and make those tests repeatable so that um, many um, products can all be tested the exact same way. Uh, so on the side here, you can see uh, this is a serial converter that came out of the ROV that I had to take out. And at the time, I had no idea what it was. There was no documentation for it at all. It was just a little uh, little circuit stuck on some perf board um, that if it broke, I would have had to have built from scratch. Um, because there was no documentation for it. So be aware, don't don't leave these things behind for other people to sort out. Um, and don't leave it behind for you to sort out six months later when you've moved on and done a half dozen other dozen other things um, that you now have to go back and redesign or, or reverse engineer what you did. Um, so finally, we have 
troubleshooting. Troubleshooting takes time. Um, things are going to go wrong with whatever it is you build. The trick is, what do you do when things go wrong? So the first thing is, take your time. Mistakes are going to happen when you rush. That's when that's when you start plugging 48 volts into a 3.3 volt line. Um, that's when you start reverse polarizing things because you plug something in backwards. So take your time, take a deep breath, walk through the problem methodically. Start at the symptom and work your way back through the circuit, back through the system until you find where the problem is. Um, and finally, ask for help. Uh, don't just spin your wheels. Ask for help or talk through the problem with a colleague or your rubber duck. Um, just talking it out sometimes is enough. Doesn't matter if it's an inanimate object or you know someone who doesn't know anything about engineering. It could be a colleague. Sometimes that's helpful too. Um, and then sometimes a set of fresh eyes is all that you need because sometimes a set of fresh eyes is the one that's going to tell you, hey, your circuit's not working because it's not plugged in. Um, so yeah, just just talk through it. Uh, so I'm gonna get through our our story time here, if that's okay, Kyle. Um, so in uh, in my final year of Eastern Ant Robotics, the size restrictions changed. So up until then, we had been running with a two electronics can system, and I had worked um, with the under the excellent mentorship of another senior electrical student. And we this system had been built on and approved upon every year that I was there, and it had been passed from like previous students to him. So it was. Um, this was a work of art. This has been had been worked on for many, many years. Um, and then my year, my final year, my mentor, the student that I've been working with for all these years, uh, had graduated and the size restrictions changed and I needed to be able to fit all of this stuff into this single smaller can. So, uh, first thing is nothing was documented or very little was documented. The next thing was, um, one of the biggest pieces in those uh, in those dual electronics cans was a uh, major big power. We had two big power supplies to supply our thrusters um, because the thrusters could actually pull more current than what uh, than what we could provide. So we worked it out and figured out that okay, no, we can actually get away with a single one to save us all that space if we speed limit the thrusters. The other key thing about these thrusters is that they worked on a uh, on an addressed communication protocol. Uh, that our computer didn't understand. So there was a microcontroller that sat in between those that would like um, translate the communication from the top side computer down to these thrusters. Uh, this microcontroller was written in, this was the irreplaceable part that I almost blew up. Uh, it was written in low level assembly code. It was on this PCB that a former student had designed like the year before I joined the team. Uh, and if there was documentation for it at one time, it had been lost. So while, so I, I rejigged everything and I put it in the smaller can, I modularized everything using those PCBs that I talked about, we were practicing. And then all of a sudden the thrusters would stop. And I immediately thought, oh no, our calculations are wrong. We can't get away with a single power supply, but I don't have the room for the power supply. What am I going to do? So we started testing. Um, and we found that no, that's actually not the case. The the power was available to the thrusters, so it wasn't that. So we started testing some more, and eventually we saw that the thrusters wouldn't actually just stop, but they would kind of get stuck in whatever the last command that they had was for a short period of time. So we knew that they were still communicating somewhere, um, and they still had the power to keep going. Uh, so during all this troubleshooting, that little PCB got damaged. And we had to build a new one with no documentation, looking at the broken PCB. That's all we had to go on. And like I said, so after, while I was testing the new PCB, the one that we had built, that's when I put the 48 volts down the 3.3 volt line. And there was a conversation about, uh, after I had done it and not realized what I'd done, there was a conversation about, oh no, do we tell Bethany or not? <laughs> that she very nearly destroyed this irreplaceable part that we wouldn't have been able to operate without. Um, so after troubleshooting this for weeks, I had to leave on my grad trip and um, that same weekend that I was leaving on my grad trip, the team had to film the demo video um, because without proof that we had a working ROV, we wouldn't have been able to compete. 
So we had a robot that didn't work and we needed to complete this video. So I dug out the old thrusters from years ago um, that were directly powered via motor controllers. So I, I took the motor controllers that we had been using to operate all the tools, rigged them up to the thrusters um, and managed to get the ROV to limp enough to, uh, to get us through the video, even though the motor controllers weren't really powerful enough to run those thrusters. And then I was on the team and I was talking to everybody that I could about it, about how am I going to solve, how do we, how do we fix this problem? Um, and meanwhile, back home, the team was still working on it and the team managed to successfully submit that video. So at least we knew that we were going to the competition, just had to solve this or, or work around the problem when I got home. Um, so upon the return, we got the team together and I got a bunch of people to dangle these thrusters over the side of the acoustics tank at Marine. Um, I set up three oscilloscopes, and for those of you who don't know what an oscilloscope is, it's a device that allows you to like measure um, measure different signals and voltages and currents and stuff. They're fairly expensive, um, and they're fairly delicate pieces of equipment. Uh, and the university would not be really happy if I accidentally dropped one in a tank. So while the team was dangling these thrusters over the side of the pool, we had a plastic sheet covering the electronics bottle that was all open all over the desk and I monitored, we, we set up um, oscilloscope probes to every input, every output, every voltage, every signal. And then finally we saw that the microcontroller was stopping. The microcontroller couldn't get power, couldn't figure out why. So it turns out that when the thrusters would pull this current, um, the power supply for the thrusters or, or motors thrusters, um, would end up having to drop his voltage a little bit in order to keep power constant because power is uh, voltage time current. So um, that effect would actually ripple back through the system and it would make it all the way to the uh, five volts that was supplying the power supply. And when we looked, there was a key part of that circuit that was missing, which was called a decoupling cap. So what a decoupling cap does is it provides a small source of constant energy right before the microcontroller so that if the input is doing this, it all goes into the, to the decoupling cap and that those fluctuations are decoupled um, from the power that the microcontroller actually sees. And between losing the documentation and uh, working with the broken circuit and all that stuff, um, the decoupler got missed. And, uh, and that was the problem. So as soon as we installed that, oh, the microcontroller now works, the thrusters get their signal, we can go to the competition. Um, the sad part is we had spent so much time um, working on just troubleshooting this problem, we ended up not being able to do all the testing that we needed to do. So um, yeah, so that was, if we had, if we had kept it simple and kept our documentation, um, if we hadn't been so attached to having to stick with those thrusters, um, uh, you know, all of those lessons came came to bear uh, during during this one big troubleshooting experience. Oops. Um, so yeah, uh, I just had another a couple other quick tips that I've learned uh, during the course of my career. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna solder something, make sure you add heat shrink, label wires before you start cutting them, because otherwise you won't know where to go. Um, breathe it while you solder because flux isn't good for you. Um, take pictures of things before you take it apart so that you know how to put it back together. Ask questions when you don't understand so you don't waste time um, on something that could take someone else like five minutes to explain. Um, check continuity before you apply power. Like I said, uh, make sure things are plugged in where they need to be. Um, make friends with technicians because they are a fountain of knowledge. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of techs in the, in the basement of the engineering building that made all those really annoying labs bearable. Uh, make sure you get to know them and become friends with them. And uh, neat trick, twist wires with a drill uh, to make your wiring hurts look neat. So yeah, uh, that's, that's the lessons that I learned, the, the experiences I'd like to share. All of these things come into play at work every day while I'm working on the big ROV or big uh, autonomous vehicles now at, at Kraken. So. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for the presentation, Bethany. Um, it was kind of neat to uh, have been one of your teammates and, and get this presentation. <laughs> And uh, I even noticed that I snuck my way into one of your pictures. 
um, so uh, everyone who's out there in the audience, uh, Bethany is a fountain of knowledge and uh, she is a great teacher. So if you have any questions for her at all, please just don't hesitate to pop them in the chat or uh, put up your hand and, and let us know that you want to ask that question personally. And uh, to kick it off, I always have a question that I like to ask in, in these sessions. Um, so Bethany, what's your favorite part of being a designer at a tech company? Oh gosh. Um, I guess the really neat thing is doing things that haven't been done before and uh, solving problems that no one's no one solved before. So uh, uh, one of the things that I'm working on now at Kraken is an autonomous underwater vehicle called Thunderfish XL, and it's a giant vehicle, um, and it has all kinds of sensors on it that have never been put together in this way. That it can it can carry all these different pieces of equipment, and with it, we're going to be able to see things on the ocean floor that probably have never been seen ever before. Um, so I really like being a part of that. I really like that. Um, the favorite thing that I do though is still PCB design. I'm so happy that I got that I learned that from uh, from Eastern Edge because I like I said it's arguably my my favorite task at work is designing new PCBs. Great. Um, so as a note on PCBs to everybody out there in the audience, we do have some basic tutorials on PCB design and assembly on the Student Design Hub Read the Docs page, which is in the chat. So if anybody wants to grab that link and check those out and let me know where we might have mistakes, that would be fantastic. <laughs> um, so Bethany, I love the way that you structured your presentation there. Uh, Thanks. You really highlighted a lot of really core uh, design philosophies, which are really helpful, I think, to students. Um, oh, we have a question from uh, Nick. Uh, As a student who's nearing the end of his degree, I oftentimes regret not having joined a student team. Is it too late for me to join and contribute to a team and gain that experience, or are my sentiments and or are my sentiments justified? Uh, so it's never too late. Uh, actually, um, my partner joined the team in like his second last year of university, and he always said that he wishes he had joined it sooner. But the experience that you that that he gained, even in that short period of time, uh, were really important and taught a lot of valuable lessons. So. No, join join a team. And if you can't join a team, like if you if you've graduated and and um, those teams aren't available to you anymore, um, pick up an Arduino kit. Find a problem that you need to solve. Like um, I I was working on designing a lighting system for my fish tank that I want it to be able to include uh, you know timers and different colors and stuff. Uh, you know, just a side project. Do something um, that gets you working on a project, whether it's it's on a student team uh, or even just get your own team together and say, I want to build an ROV. You don't need to go to a competition. Just throw it off the side of a wharf and see what's under there. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of things that you can do in your spare time um, in order to gain that experience. So no, it's never too late. Absolutely, Nick. And there's lots of teams that you can get involved with here at the university. Um, We've got info sessions coming up every week from different groups from 5 to 6 o'clock on Thursdays. So if you want to learn about a different team, just come on up to the faculty lounge on Thursdays from 5 to 6. And uh, this week we have Baja, next week is Paradigm Hyperloop, and uh, we have a new group called RoboSub, which designs AUVs, coming up after that. So that's a, you know, there's lots of lots to get involved with here. Um, so Bethany, I, I do want to mention that I really like that uh, you highlighted interdisciplinary uh, support and, and projects as being really critical to the design process. And yeah, uh, yeah. you'll even find that when you get out in industry that uh, you always have to have people from different disciplines, you know, coordinating on any project. Uh, for my time in the working as a subsea engineer, we would have every single vendor with all of their key engineers come in and do a, uh, a commissioning on paper exercise before anything went offshore for, for you know, design and implementation, and that's just to make sure that you, you catch anything that, that might come up because you just, you don't know what you don't know sometimes and you're sometimes limited by your discipline, so. Absolutely, uh, yep. I see a question from Alex here. Uh, since the deal with Pangeo, have there been any big advancements from that team? Um, 
Not that I'm aware of, but I'm on the technical engineering side, so uh, I'm I'm not always privy to uh, to any big advancements un until I'm called upon. So uh, I'm not sure, um, but you know, follow Kraken social media. They they definitely uh, love sharing any big advancements like that. Great. Okay. Um... <laughs> It's uh, it's just so fun to see this from the other side of the, you know, presentation. Haven't haven't been there with you. Um, yeah. Just to highlight everything that Bethany said, one through seven, they're all fantastic uh, suggestions that you can keep in mind when you're working on a project. And uh, a, a great one is don't get attached. Um, I remember one year that we were uh, we were trying to build some sort of manipulator, and uh, we were using pistons to actuate it to open and close the scripper. And we ended up getting rid of the whole thing and just using a piece of PVC with a gouge out of it. Um, yep. yep. <laughs> as Beth being said, you know, you can do a lot with a stick. So uh, sometimes you want to take that first iteration of your design and do something really complicated. And and there's a lot to it and you're proud of it, but it might, again, not necessarily be the best way to solve the problem. Yep. Yeah, people, uh, and I'm I'm guilty of it too, you know, you dream up these really incredible ideas and you love to see it come to life. Um, but at the end of the day, can you do it with a stick? Well, then it's the stick's probably the better option. <laughs> yeah. um, any more questions in the audience out there? So while I'm waiting for our audience to chime in with some more questions, um, I do wanna jump in on what you mentioned with documentation as well. Uh, yes. So when I worked as a subsea engineer in, in the US, uh, I was working on a decommissioning of a tree, which is, you know, a, a subsea well, uh, that was about 25 years old. And uh, uh -oh. that's, that system was installed in the early to mid nineties. And you better believe there was not a lick of documentation about the thing. So it's just an absolutely painful exercise trying to go back and figure things out and because you never really know until you're down there looking at it. So how do you plan for that? And how do you how do you work around the information that you don't have? And yeah. the amount that we, of time that we had to spend just to get together an actionable plan for the scope of work we needed to do was crazy. So documentation is probably the most important thing you'll ever do as an engineer. And if you can work it into your everyday practices now while you're a student, you're going to be a very, very valuable employee down the line. Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to mention that too. Engineers have a really bad rap for being terrible writers. Um, <laughs> and it's true. And document to us, that documentation seems boring. No one needs to worry about that. Uh, it is critically important. And if you are a good technical writer, um, that is a very rare skill to be both a good engineer and a good technical writer. And if you have those skills, if you can develop those skills, you are going to be an extremely valuable and very employable engineer in the future. Um, so keep keep that in mind. Awesome. Um, and another thing about documentation is uh, when you're fixing things after something has broken and you need to go back in there and fix it, make sure you document what you did to fix it because it, the same problem could crop up in another project. I've seen that happen. I actually, I keep a list of like gotchas of, um, of things to always check because I've been caught by them before. Um, so yeah, so make sure you, and, and the other thing is when you put a fix in and then it goes inside an electronics bottle and then it goes out into the world somewhere. Um, if you ever get that back, uh, if you don't document the little changes and fixes that you put in at the end, if you ever get that back, well, then the drawings that you have don't match it. Um, so, so even as you're fixing it, as you're doing little upgrades, make sure you document those two. Awesome. Well, uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions in the queue. Um, well, everyone, Bethany has been kind enough to put up her email address here for everyone to see. Um, if you have questions for her, I'm sure she wouldn't mind answering a few. Um, and uh, as always, you can always reach out to me down here on the first floor. I sit in room 1006. If you want to get involved. Oh, excellent. We have another question from Josh. Uh, what was the most tedious task you had to deal with as an international at the international mate competition? That's a great the question. Most, the most tedious. 
most tea time. Cleaning up the room that we kept the ROV in, that was the most tedious. Um, so when we would go away on international competitions, someone would get the uh, honorable task of having their hotel room turn into a workshop. And that meant that you could not have uh, any housekeeping services for the whole week that you were in there. And yeah, uh, I mean, keep your workspaces tidy. That's another good lesson out of this too. Keep your workplaces tidy. Uh, yeah, so having to uh, try to find things at, you know, day five of the competition in your hotel room somewhere, that was pretty tedious. Um, that was, yeah, that was rough. <laughs> It's also pretty interesting to have that hotel room workshop uh, with 15 people crammed into it, two queen beds, and <laughs> you're making makeshift tables and whatever you can. So, yep, yep. Uh, I have to say, my, uh, and, and to plug teams some more, my most favorite memories of university are the times that I spent on Eastern Edge, and they were the friends that I made uh, on that student team because. You know, you you really go through trials and tribulations and challenges with those people. You're there the whole step of the way. Um, but I have kept many of those friends. For other friends from university, we've lost touch over the years. But my Eastern Edge friends, I'm lucky enough actually to work with several of them now, um, and that's a really really cool feeling too. So yeah, my most fond memories from university are all from from Eastern Edge, especially on those trips where, you know, you're, you're staying up until midnight because the can the electronics can leaked in the competition or those uh you know one of the tools failed and or the prop that you were designing for is not quite what's at the competition and now you have to readjust everything and yeah solving those problems on competition day is, is a fun experience too yeah you get you really get to uh you really get to bond with your with your friends uh when you're doing these competitions it's uh I'll, I'll say it was the highlight of my university career as well. Um, being able to go and, you know, spend all that time with, you know, a small group of people, get really intimately knowledgeable about something, but also go to this global competition where you get to network with different teams. And uh, in 2015, when, when the competition was hosted here, uh, the Scottish team came over and uh, they hit it off with the Newfie team. <laughs> oh, we all had a great time with the Scots. <laughs> <laughs> and then they ended up, you know, hanging out and a lot of them kept in touch. So it, it, it's amazing how you can quickly become friends with people on these competitions and well, as well. And, and uh, I remember a competition we went to in Seattle where uh, one of the other teams had used a slip ring design for their cameras. And the works of us on our team, we were just mind boggled that their camera could go 360 degrees around the electronics enclosure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was... Uh... Yeah, we were drooling over that. And that's the other thing is when you're when you're at an international competition like that, and I even saw that when I was at Lego, um, you know, there, just the amount of ideas that all these different people would come up with when faced with the same set of problems. And some of them would be really complicated ideas and some of them would re be really simple ideas, but they were just so diverse. Um, and yeah, and the networking aspect and the other the other really neat thing that I always was really cool. Uh, I always thought was really cool was the people that you meet at those competitions from industry. Um, so I met the first uh, the first female engineer that ever worked for Oceaneering. She was a judge for us, and having having that experience uh, to to meet her was incredible. Um, you know, and and to share stories of what industry was like um, like then, uh, yeah, and to to share those experiences with her was really really cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any more questions from our uh, our attendees out there? Uh, Kyle, I've lost my chat window, so I don't know if I'm oh. getting uh, private windows on. Okay. Um, I haven't seen anyone come in since Josh on the Q&A or Nick on the chat bar. So if you don't see any over there, I, I don't think we've missed anyone. But if someone has been missed, just ping us again. Definitely don't want to miss your questions. <laughs> Okay, uh, it looks like that's it for our questions. Um, thank you very much, Bethany, for taking the time to do this presentation. I 
I, I certainly enjoyed it, and I hope that our audience also did as well. Um, and I hope this is just a good example for all of you how getting involved can lead to a really valuable student experience and can be really valuable in your career. So uh, hopefully we'll see you on a student team and uh, we'll be able to get you involved. Alrighty, everyone, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.